welcome back to a smorgasbord of delicious new MariaDB. Uh, Daniel works at the MariaDB Foundation, contributing full-time and supporting related aspects of the MariaDB software ecosystem. With the next long-term MariaDB version having been released, Daniel will outline the very delicious database changes of MariaDB, contributed by MariaDB and community developers. Please welcome Daniel. Thank you, Fiona. I begin today by acknowledging the Wadundri people, uh, warring people of the Kulin Nation, uh, custodians of the land on which we uh, gather today, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend this respect and welcome to the Aborigines and Torres Strait Islanders here today. Welcome everyone. I hope you can build up your appetite before lunch. Um, I'm running actually in a browser in a binder session. If you want to actually follow along and play with your own um, test versions of the same samples, please do so. And it won't bother me whatsoever because, you know, I'm running a separate instance, uh, thanks to the kind guys uh, and girls at Binder. So when I say new features, um, what I'm going to be talking today about everything uh, that came after 10.6, so the, the 10.7 and beyond. 10.6 uh, was the last GA uh, uh, as of almost two years ago. Um, so what's happened since 10.6 came out is we've done a number of releases on a one-year support cycle um, on 10.7, 10.8, 10.9, and now 10N. 10.11 is the long-term support release that's going into the next um, uh, Debian and Ubuntu. So since um, some of you may not have been exposed to 10.7 and beyond, I'm going to actually start there and ask some questions uh, if we want to backtrack a little bit to you know what actually happened in 10.6 and before I can actually go into some of those there. So the first thing I'm going to point out here, a uh, feature, is that um, UUID is now a data type. Um, for those who are using Postgres, probably had this already for a number of years, but I'll say we're slowly catching up. Um, <laughs> we're catching up in, in a fast way. Um, when we added some other data types later on today, there's actually a plug-in API in the um, MariaDB for adding data types. Um, that will hopefully mature over time. But for the moment, uh, we have uh, a database we can use test. Um, and am I hitting the right button? Um, yep. And you know, we insert, insert it. Uh, this is what happens. You repeat things. Um, yeah, and that syntax has been there for a while. So UUIDs um, look like text, treated like text, push in as text, come out as text, um, but they're actually stored in the, the compressed uh, eight byte format. Can also convert, you know, uh, 32 byte binaries as that, and they go there as a unique value. Um, and then if we go, go through, you know, all the different ways to represent, they, they look like a type. Like any type, there are invalid values, like long live that bear. Sorry, bear, um, you're not a value value, and you get incorrect types, as you may expect on that. So next up, we have a uh, INET4 data type, and you go, whoa, what about INET, uh, INET6? And it's like, actually, INET6 was added way back in 10.5, um, and so the, the quick little refresher on INET6 um, um, is that you know it's a data type, and this is when we first introduced data types. Um, and in that, you can do um, IP version four mapped addresses and IP version six. Uh, as you expect with the data type, uh, no matter if you use the compressed form of INET version six or the extended version, um, they are exactly the same. So we return a result that way. Now back to INET version four. Um, strangely enough. It looks like INET version 4, you put IP version 4 types in, you receive IP version 4 types out, and I guess like all data types, what we try to do in the database is to store them as small as possible so you can fit as much in. 
A big jump that sort of happened in uh, MariaDB 10.10 um, was that we actually updated the UCA standard um, uh, collations or added explicitly the UCA standards uh, of UCA 11, which came out last year. Uh, so year before, geez, losing track. What year is it again? <laughs> Maybe I need that year type. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're just trying to confuse me. Um, so what we get in the collations is um, a huge bunch of things uh, on there. So if we just look at the initial ones uh, so far, what you may recognise if you've done collations in um, uh, MariaDB uh, before is you've got a case sensitive and a case insensitive. What the latest standards of the UCA add is an accent insensitive and an accent sensitive um, type uh, as well for those um, where it matters on that. And like before, we've got uh, a notepad options. And this will, um, the collations is the order of uh, a character set and you know what makes things equivalent. And the accent insensitive, the case insensitive, um, reduce the equivalence down. And there's also so things like contractions and various other things that I encourage you not to ask me about because um, it's all in the standard um, and you can read those. And if you do, hopefully someone else in the audience knows better than me about that. Uh, like the, the previous standards, there's ordering for, you know, everything from Icelandic, Latvian, Romanian, Slovenian, Polish, Estonian, Spanish, blah, 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 blah. There's a lot of them. <laughs> Never trust the standards body to, you know, go on the brevity. <laughs> I'm sure they're paid by the, uh, the, the paperweight. Um, collations, um, go back to like a UTF-8 character set, um, just like you'd expect, and they yeah, go with any of them. So, yeah, that's them. Other things we've been improving are things like the, the JSON support. Uh, so we've got like a JSON equals. Um, obviously that, um, you know, uh, the spaces don't matter in JSON as to where they are. However, uh, what does matter uh, is the order of arrays. If we swap them around, they're no longer the same JSON object. Um, so uh, that's useful there. Sometimes you may want to um, normalize them all to the same thing. So I've developed an algorithm here that normalizes all JSON objects into the same representation. Uh, and what that means is that uh, we can uh, define a generated column as the function of the normalized version of the value, add a unique key on the output of that function. And now what we've got uh, is such that um, you can't insert duplicates. So here that, you know, the order of uh, things in an object is um, the equivalent. So here you've got a, a uniqueness value that you can ap apply on it. Uh, JSON pretty um, was pretty much an, an alias of JSON details, what we already had done this for MySQL compatibility, and this was something that actually was contributed by our user base, or user community in general. Um, so it just outputs it in a pretty way. And it was really simple to implement. Uh, CRC32C, um, I know it's probably not the, uh, the most um, useful thing, but honestly it was added because um, Marco, our InnoDB developer, wanted to write a test case because it uses it underneath. And it's like, well, we may as well expose it as a function. <laughs> uh, we've got all the implementation underneath. You know, what's a few more um, lines of code <laughs> in, in a you know, large code base and give the users the opportunity if they have a use for it? Um, random bytes, also a user contribution. Um, works the same as MySQL. Strangely enough, returns a random number of bytes. I think it's PRNG. Sorry, uh, how secure is it? Um, and the, the random, I think it's, from memory, it's um, PRNG. Um, it's used the open SSL underneath. Um, it might actually be cryptographically secure. Let me check, 
let me check that one later and, and I'll get back to you on that. Uh, next up, JSON histograms. Uh, so it doesn't mean much on its own. In MariaDB 10.0, a uh, bunch of histograms were there to describe the format um, and distribution of values in a table, and this was used by the query planners to work out, you know, is Jane common or Julie common? If so, I might use that index or another one, depending on how common it is. Uh, as you probably know, um, data sets are not always, you know, these beautiful um, normalised graphs um, of values that they have biases and, and that kind of thing. And what we done with JSON histograms, we've put uh, a JSON format as the output. And what that means is we can adapt the bin size of least common, less common values um, to be a bigger bin and have a, a finer granularity on um, the other ones. So if we look at this, uh, just throw some dummy data into it, um, like, like we did uh, with uh, to generate the statistics on a table, use analyze table. Uh, we add the persistent for all, and that means it's actually a persistent statistic that's stored rather than uh, a random sampling at query time. And what this looks like in the um, tables, um, all the way at the end, uh, can't quite see it, is um, a JSON object that describes the kind of bins uh, available and you know what the likelihood is there. Um, if I wanted to paste far too much data into this, um, you'd come out with uh, a lot more data and a lot more bins as to describe the um, data better. And that just helps with your query execution. Uh, natural sort key. Um, uh, Seemingly useful thing. I mean, normally when you sort by a column, uh, if it's just got characters, you expect like an alpha numeric order. Uh, and what natural sort key does is treats the alphas as like alphas. It treats the numbers like numbers. Uh, and so let's add some sample data. Uh, so what you get here is what you see as a, a normal ordering as to what you expect on the things um, on those. So you get, you know, things like A11 before A2. Now, when you uh, use an order by the natural sort key of that, um, what you end up with is, you know, what A's before B's, 1's before 2's, 2's before 11's, and all the way through. So other, you know, seem not immediately obvious applications of things um, is... Uh, things like um, IP, yeah, version 5, yeah, obviously it's got 400, so um, it's not 4 or 6. <laughs> <laughs> so it's IP version 5 addressing, uh, and now we sort of sort all those in, um, in what actually looks like a, a more natural order for people to actually see them in. Um, and, you know, it's stored as text, but, you know, it comes out on top that way. For those who have um, ever done SQL and have, you know, big, large, concatenate kind of uh, SQL statements or little bits of formatting in, uh, we added this function, and this is actually another Google Summer of Code um, uh, contribution uh, from our user base that sort of uses the, the Python kind of formats uh, to um, in there as a function and can quickly do what Python-like formats do. And yeah, just format the output. And this is using the lib format uh, algorithm, uh, lib format library underneath, so it actually can support a lot more, you know, variants than just these uh, simple substitutions. But even in these simple substitutions, you've got added readability um, and easier to write and, you know, less counting of braces, I assume. <laughs> Okay, like there? Yeah. Good. Cool. 
Uh, descending inde indexes, um, it's sort of been in the syntax for a while and it was pretty much ignored. It sort of parsed it for compatibility versions and then just assorted um, ascending. Uh, so now we've actually got true um, ascending and descending indexes and that really plays into uh, account when you actually do ordering by one index in one order and and another index, another part of the compound index in the other order. order. And what that means um, is that in the query, um, you'll go, da da, we're using that index, R, um, we're using the full length of it and going through. Uh, for those that are far more um, astute, you may have noticed I did a force index. Uh, in writing this talk, I realised that there's actually a bug. It doesn't actually choose that automatically. So that's in the queue to be fixed. <laughs> Always trust to talk to, you know, show up. Um, oh, <laughs> almost obvious bugs in the things. Um, yeah, and same if we uh, reverse the order. So A was a descending index and B was ascending. Uh, if we do it the other way, um, A ascending, B descending um, means we still can use the same index, we've just got to transverse it the other direction. And that's exactly what to do. Interesting enough, it doesn't actually show the direction. Maybe it doesn't matter that much. Uh, for those that have actually played with petitions, who's played with petitions before? <laughs> uh, anyone actually like them? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit like that. So this is what you previously had to do to re re okay, replace a petition. So it got a bit of data loading um, and then we create a table like the petition table. We remove the petitioning on it and then we uh, swap one with the other on the petitions and this is just all very verbose to actually do the same thing uh, that we needed actually for SQL statements to uh, remove a um, exchange of petition in the table to out of the table. So we simplified it that um, now we do uh, just one statement. So we had our, our table, we've got data in that um, and added a petition and exchange a position. Oh, sorry, that was the, the previous one, extended way to remove it. It's not surprising, it's confusing. Uh, okay, and now we've got like convert petition. So we convert petition one to a normal table. One, one line of SQL to um, move one of your uh, petitions out to a separate table, or vice versa. Um, oops, problems when you do it. Um, and you can also do it the verse other way. You can grab a table that's out and um, import it into uh, a petition table with a criteria of what it actually represents on that petition. So, you know, little syntax uh, uh, improvements that save a lot of jumbling around or, you know, copying and pasting other things on the internet. System version tables, anyone come across or use them before? Silence, set, refi, um, later in this example you'll actually see what it uh, means a bit. So system versioning was, I believe, a 2011 SQL um, standard extension. Uh, so it's got system versioning, a date. Um, in MariaDB, I didn't list, it's probably 10.10 um, or 10.11. Um, we added a bit that allows you to insert the history. Uh, the SQL standard is rather strict on it. It sort of says, well, whatever's in the table is, must be in the table. Um, but, you know, you have to load these sometimes. And so what this does, it gives the ability to load it. So we've got a table, it's just got one int, uh, x primary key. Um, we load it in, uh, but we specify the row start and the row ten end time, and those are fixed time values there. And we say, 
for this table, you know, between the times of um, the beginning of 1980 and beginning of 1980 uh, and 20 hours and one second, um, this value existed in the table. So the good thing about systems that I've run before, uh, the system time is that you can query what the table looks like at a particular time. So this, yeah, the system version tables maintains a view of what is the current data and what was there before. And so this is really good for anyone doing like audit logs or uh, that kind of thing, or just resource allocation is like, what did the resource allocation look like so long ago? <laughs> You've got it in one query now. Um, usual questions, you know, if you query it of, you know, too late, it's an empty set. If you query it um, too early, it's an empty set. And that's just what the table looked like at the time. Uh, I see William's not in the room to harass me about, you know, passwords, but for those that, you know, obliged to uh, use it, um, you know, we've got a password reach has, um, uh, reuse functionality, so create a user, set the password, set it again, and, you know, there's a limited number of times you can reuse it. Uh, the exact number is actually just an option on the plugin, and so this is a, a pre-built plugin. Um, like, you know, many of these kind of, you know, plugins, there's an opportunity to actually, you know, write your own um, plugin on password requirements if you want. Uh, something I got reminded last night um, that since MariaDB, <laughs> now stretching my memory, it was at least 10.2 or 10.3, there's been a data at risk encryption uh, out there and there's been a number of key management plugins. Um, this has been very slowly develop developing, I, uh, I admit, but you know, there's a number and I guess HashCorp um, produce a key management plugin. It stores things and now there's a plugin that interacts with it. Get diagnostics. Um, I actually got to admit, I didn't actually know this feature existed uh, until last year. Um, and this is an information about getting information of uh, the current state of the machine. So we've just got a table with a primary key. Uh, we insert a value one. And now we've got insert a value, a set of values, and one is there again, and it's obviously a duplicate. So the question is, you know, from a program perspective, how do we determine, you know, which one was the duplicate? Um, I guess we could look at the values, but you know, if uh, for more complicated queries, it may not actually be obvious from the values as to to which one is actually causing the error. Um, so get diagnostics now includes the row number. Uh, that you can get into a user variable and you can select the user variable and it goes number two. And that means the second item in there is the one that actually calls the, the warning. Uh, so this is the extension. There's a, a bunch of other uh, information that you can re return with get diagnostic. Another, this I think was the Google Summer Code as well, uh, contribution. Uh, that it, we can mark the uh, in and out and in out uh, attributes of the parameters of function with an attribute to describe which way they actually uh, go and what they use. And these are, uh, attributes just help uh, coders, you know, make sure they're using the things the right way. A minor li limitation, uh, maybe it's more mo more than minor, um, is that it can be used in like set queries. Uh, like that, so set result equals the function. Um, I think it's due to something internally that select queries, you can't actually have um, out values in them in some ways. Um, I'm not sure why that is, it's probably just the way user function, user variables are actually processed in SQL, that it, um, it's just a limitation that's there. Uh, important to know uh, before you <laughs> see something that's almost working and not. For those that uh, do uh, replication, uh, there's an alter, uh, a two-phase uh, replication. 
uh, statement on altar tables. So for those who are big, you know, one after the other, other the other in, in chains. So in this case, uh, when this system variable is set, um, that's still audible. Uh, good, that's a move timber. Uh, what happens is the alter statement is actually uh, pushed down to the replication. It starts uh, executing on the replica immediately. When it finishes on the master, there's a, a commit message that goes into the um, uh, binary log as well. And when the uh, replicas actually receive that, they'll uh, swap it over. And this means your alter table on your master is uh, keeps up, assuming similar hardware compatibilities and other things. Uh, uh, with your replica keeps up with your primary um, in the same way. Uh, GTID support was added in MariaDB 10.1, possibly. Uh, we finally actually <laughs> got around to uh, introducing the GTI positions into um, you know, the client util utilities of MariaDB bin log. Um, from you know start position to stop position to a bunch of filtering commands, um, so that's all there now. Uh, yeah, like it should have been five years ago. Um, but anyway, <laughs> better late than never. <laughs> uh, for those who've actually played around with GTIDs, um, and it probably is almost the same. Um, uh, tell me if there's a decent, you know. Um, confusion flee um, implementation out, but um, hopefully we've done a bit to do it. But working out where to actually start and stop replication from, um, especially as you're switching uh, masters to slaves and slaves to masters and primaries and secondaries, it's not always immediate to which one you're doing it, especially if you're trying to do it in a, in a failover disaster situation. And yeah, it's uh, easy to get wrong. So what we did is improve the syntax. So you just need to change master to demote to slave and that will know which position it's at and where it has to continue from. Uh, on grants and the privilege system, uh, there's now a, a grant to public. Public is uh, applies to any user that has access on the system. So you're effectively giving a, a grant to everyone uh, who's got access. It's not the same as an anonymous user. An uh, anonymous user can, um, uh, if you say grant to public, it doesn't mean that that becomes anonymous, the user exists. It, it ha it's, a, it's a separate concept on that one. So here we grant select on the entire test space to anyone who's got a user on the system. Um, and you can obviously yeah, extend that to any other thing uh, in the, the grant syntax. Previously on, moving on to read only, um, that previously uh, a super user on MariaDB uh, was able to uh, write even if the um, uh, the server was actually set into a read-only mode. Uh, there's situations where this isn't um, really appropriate, or, or you know, can easily overlook the fact that you know far too many things log in as um, a, a root or a super user. So over, I think since about 10.5 onwards, we've slowly broken the super user. Um, uh, privilege up into a number of more distinct privileges from uh, in now we've got like a read-only admin that can change that. We've also done uh, binary uh, log admins, replication admins, and I'm trying to remember all off the head. So, uh, but yeah, there's a large number of finely grained um, privileges that can be granted rather than, uh, you know, one privilege to rule them all. Uh, so there's very few things that actually are left under that, um, you know, notional super privilege. Uh, okay, so your show grants, we revoke the read only admin um, from the root user, um, and uh, like all actually revokes, they actually start on the the next session. So in this case, we still can set read only, but if you logged in again um, or a different connection, um, you wouldn't actually be able to. 
uh, change the read only. In the InnoDB space, what we've done is to increase the, the number of people that do you know, bulk inserts to uh, load up data. Um, this is under a uh, condition that the, the front key checks and the unique checks are off. Um, and this is hopefully just a, a temporary um, limitation that we need to apply. There was some complexities um, around um, someone added like unique blobs um, that turned out to be um, a rather complicated thing with a large number of uh, edge cases and uh, for the moment that um, setting those user variables is required uh, to make this a feature fully um, performant. So whether we insert, um, create a table and do a, a very large uh, select statement or a load data or if you do an insert uh, data with uh, a huge list of values. Uh, this will be quicker because it um, doesn't actually need to write all the rollback things. It, it knows that, you know, if something fails here, it rolls back to an empty table. Um, so there's a, a lot of writing and, and overhead in the CPU that has been uh, reduced by this. It's been a number of resize segments in the table spaces. Uh, that can be changed if you uh, stop and start. Um, it's, it's not actually dynamic in the, um, uh, uh, in the user interface, yes. However, what is, is the InnoDB log size is resizable. So if you've got you know, a default size there for some reason that's rather small, you end up doing a, a lot, a lot of bulk inserts uh, on things, you can actually resize that uh, dynamically at runtime or down. In fact, uh, what has happened, if I probably didn't spell deprecated right, yep, good, uh, <laughs> it was late. Um, so the change buffer in InnoDB has actually been uh, removed. Uh, why we did this was there's been um, a huge number of bugs over the years that have sort of been impossible to really track down or get in a, a a, a test case for so this uh, feature of you know change buffer that sort of been in in an ADB for a while has been removed, so that in theory should mean that a whole class of bugs is just gone, um, much to Marco's relief. Uh, so it was uh, kind of deprecated and ignored in in 10.9 on, onwards. Uh, honestly, the code's still there, but you can't actually access it, so it's been removed now in 11.0 plus there. Uh, apostrophes in full text, um, fairly obvious that, you know, strangely enough, apostrophes do actually form a meaningful part of text. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's, you know, run it and insert some data, and guess what? You actually get things with apostrophes there. Um, uh, and it, no, you know, DB's, um, yeah, and uh, there are, you know, absolute fantastic uh, t text searches in the open source database, but, you know, if you want something simple, at least you've got something simple that um, does some fairly basic things, right, like apostrophes. And the, the same applies to matches there. Uh, in a DB software pull a commit, maybe I was wrong to actually show the code here, um, but what happens is uh, the main bit is when we free memory in the in ADB, um, what happens is that we uh, tell the operating system we're not using this anymore. And so this notion, it may look still allocated as the server, it may still even be resonant, but at the point that the someone runs up far too many PHP processors or that, the operating system is feel free to reclaim that memory from that. And this is like a first step in uh, a number of things we want to try to get done to make MariaDB not this, you know, big memory hog um, of the entire system, that it can actually be a little bit more adaptive. Um, further work in the, the works that I haven't actually done is looking at like memory pressures um, from the operating system and saying, well, okay, if there's memory pressure, maybe we don't need a, a 10 year old, 10 minute old cached version of a page. 
Okay, quick stop looking at code. It, it's gone. Um, my, my apologies for inflicting on you, but yes, it is, does exist that way. Uh, system versioning um, gives us the ability to auto size the partitions uh, for those uh, doing that. And this sort of helps you kind of realize that, you know, if you're keeping an audit log for, you know, several months as to what's that, you may eventually may want to swap it out. Uh, partitions are a really nice way to swap out data and, and remove them quickly. Um, so let's make it actually auto created as well. And yep, so those. A user contribution um, was MariaDB dump, uh, order by size, so this dumps out the, the small tables first. Uh, it, uh, unlike some other databases that MariaDB's um, uh, table changes aren't actually atomic yet, so you could actually, while you're dumping out um, a, a database dump, someone changes the structure of a table, uh, the tables that normally changes are the small ones. Um, so A, let's do those first. B, they're faster. And what this means is you're more likely to have a, a reliable dump, uh, particularly on systems that uh, where users add or create or change small tables first. That was the, the concept of it anyway. Uh, user contribution, we um, now got a, a full set of uh, Chinese error messages. Uh, in uh, the server from about 10.4 up. Uh, so they're all translated through. And we're experimenting with uh, translation um, automated and of various languages. Um, recently also got uh, pushed into 10.11. It's not in the latest release, but um, a first time GitHub contributor did a whole heap of uh, Georgian translations of all the error messages as well, and sort of said, you know, Ping is like, what about the locale? Here's the data structure, here's what you change, and they did that as well. So we're getting a lot of improvements um, from our user base um, that way. So that's all I wanted to actually present uh, to you today, but do you have any questions? I have many, but I've got to Do you have any questions that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that you're depriving or waiting people to have lunch of. <laughs> okay, so there are many questions there. Um, does, oh, apart sorry, from I should Rob, always... are there questions? <laughs> Look, I think you should have at it. Well, have one. So one of the things um, uh, is, there was many of them. The last one was sure. MySQL dump, right? Yeah. I hate that. No, why do you encourage people to use that? You can't restore. If you, have you ever tried to restore a you MySQL database with like a million rows you, using MySQL dump? You can only restore it to the same version. Yes. Um, and, and it takes forever. Yeah, it's a single-threaded uh, thing. So, so, yeah. so, sorry, what I was getting at, that was, that was a statement, I'm sorry. Sure. I will phrase my question in the form of a question. Have you got any better ways of doing it? On, on the single-threaded bit, um, what we've been doing actually has been working with like the, the MyDumper uh, community um, to ensure that they've got the ability to dump all the um, MariaDB syntax and the sequences and uh, the other little extensions that we've added over the years. So that's a way to actually do parallel um, dumping um, and get a logical SQL output um, that they've been maintaining that for years and um, we're just working with the community that way to bring it up to um, the standard of all the features we need. Ha <laughs> try something harder. <laughs> oh, heck, there's a question, there's a question up the back. <laughs> you don't think by adding one CRC function you might get a whole lot of people asking for all the other CRC functions? <laughs> um, possibly, um, yes. Uh, there's only two hardware accelerated CRCs in the, in, the, um, in the server, and that's the, the IEEE and the um, uh, Castiello um, um, polynomial. <laughs> so um, there might be, but um, another thing I want to actually working on is working on this. A guy in the US started to doing Rust plugins um, 
there. So um, what's actually implemented out, there's a, a MariaDB Rust UDF crate. Um, so you can actually write UDF functions in Rust and you can write whatever polynomial you want in there or whatever other function you want in there and it'll come up in standard syntax. So, yeah, write it in Rust and don't crash the server. Huh? Thank you all for coming.